Hello and welcome again, Royal Family. And for any new members, welcome back. I pretty much try to get two messages a week on here. Uh, every other week I do a message at gbible.org, Grace Bible Church, uh, under Pastor Robert McLaughlin Bible Ministries. Many of you know that. If you're new to the channel, you go to gbible.org, you'll see me there. You'll also see, if you go on my playlist um, on this channel here on YouTube, you'll see my teaching at Grace Bible Church. Um, you'll see the pulpit, the big cross behind it. So if you're new, um, that's a church that I'm an associate pastor under Pastor Robert McLaughlin Bible Ministries. Uh, and I appreciate that. Always a shout out to Pastor Bob. And always we give a shout out to uh, Colonel R.B. Thiem Jr. who ordained Pastor Bob. I'm in that line. Louis Perry Schaefer, the great man along that line. So I'm always humbled and grateful by that. Uh, today is what? March. It is March 5th, the year of our Lord, 2020. The title is The Tares Among the Wheat. We are going to do the Lord's Supper um, at the end of the message. If you have not done it yet this month with your church or online or going to your church and done the Lord's Supper, I always do a brief um, Lord's Supper at the end of my message during the first week of the month. I wanted to get it in last lesson, but I also had principles I wanted to cover so it didn't feel right. So I knew I would get at this message. So we are going to do the Lord's Supper. All you need is a little cup of juice. I don't care what kind of juice it is. It just represents the blood of Christ. Um, it's symbolic and a piece of bread or a cracker, however you choose you want to do it. If you don't want to do it at the end and you want to tune out, that's great. But we are in Matthew chapter 13. We're going to be picking it up at verse 24 and 25. And we've been starting to tear apart the tares among the wheat, the title Matthew Lesson 145, The Tears Among the Wheat. Having said that, we're going to keep everything in prayer. Um, I've been praying about certain people, and I, now I want to keep myself in prayer, not being selfish, but I'm trying to um, get, I'm getting pulled in a lot of different directions. There's certain things going on. I don't reveal everything in my personal life. It's not, you, you all have your struggles, I have mine. Um, but for this ministry to go forward and succeed, I do need to get get it out there, get the views, get people interested, see what happens, um, and maybe it'll turn into three messages a week towards the end of the year and be more of a full-time ministry. If not, God will either pull the plug on it or he'll uh, lead me in another direction. And also, I would like to do a conference this year, and I'm having some thoughts and prayers about somewhere between uh, South Dakota and Missouri. I have some great faithful followers out in that area, and I'm thinking... I'd like to do a small conference out that way. I don't know if it's going to happen. These are just things on my heart, and I need you to pray about these things. Um, and always send me your emails. I'll, I'll pray for you if you need me to pray. I can keep it private. It doesn't have to have your full name in it or all the details. We can just put it out there, and there are prayer warriors out there listening that can pray. I can pray for you as well. My wife can as well. So um, having said that, we are getting prepared to take in the Word of God and let me get my little scriptures and my little spiel, as they say, in front of me. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word. It's all about the Word, believers, so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. We're preparing to take in the Word of God, and in doing so, I read a few scriptures that talk about washing ourselves clean from the cosmic sins and the things we get involved in, the distractions, our old sin nature getting the best of us. First John 1 John 1.8, it's talking to believers. It says, if we say we have no sin... We are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9, we're going to wash ourselves clean, because if we confess our sins, believers, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, sins you didn't even realize he cleanses you from. And in verse 10, it says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. We don't want to do that. We want to move forward in the plan of God, so we're going to take a moment of silent prayer. I appreciate you keeping... Uh, myself, uh, some things I'm getting um, pulled in different directions in prayer, and this ministry in prayer, and all those people I've brought up in recent weeks in prayer, obviously the coronavirus, anything else that's on your heart, we need to keep in prayer. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word, and we're asking you to bless those that lift this ministry up, Father, and move us forward, and let your mighty hand be on this ministry, but let your mighty hand also reach out and take care of any of the illnesses or viruses that are going out there, and those people that need the 
the healing touch in your life, Father. We know you'll come through for them in, in your way and your time, Father, and, and that's what we need to look for, your way, your time, not our way and not our time, Father. Let us always be aware of that through your Son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to jump right into it. I wanted to get this message up before Friday night. Sometimes I do run late, and I won't get a message up until Friday night. Don't panic if you don't see the second message by Thursday, um, especially on the weeks I'm not teaching at gbible.org. It just means my schedule got a little busy, and I will get it up by Friday night, maybe by 7 or 8 o'clock on a Friday night, but it'll happen. So just keep me in prayer. Keep the ministry in prayer. Thank you. Matthew chapter 13. Let's get in Matthew chapter 13. We're going to be looking at the parable of the tares among the wheat. Matthew 13, 24. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. We covered this pretty well last lesson. You should know what all this means. We'll touch on a little piece of it probably in this message as well. Matthew 13, 25. But while his men were sleeping... Remember, I always, if you're new to this channel, I always underline the principles I want you to really pay attention to. His men were sleeping. His enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. The Marvin Vincent, the Bible scholar, many of you know him from the 1800s. You should read some of his commentary. Some of it's good. Sometimes he's a little legalistic because of the time that he lived in. But he describes the tares, and I found it very interesting when I was reading a few different things about tares and the wheat in the last three or four days. The tares are the children of the wicked one, he says. Here is the character of sinners, hypocrites, all of profane and wicked people, they are the children of the devil as the wicked one. Though they do not own his name, in other words, they're not walking around with a, a Lucifer tattoo on their forehead, yet they bear his image. What's his image? To do his lust. And from him they have their education. Very interesting principle. What's out in the cosmic system, the media, the educational system, his rules over them, he works in them, he says. And that's Marvin Vincent from 1888, way back when. Pretty good Bible scholar, but again, you have to take everything with a grain of salt and see where the Spirit leads you. Some men that you read from, commentary, um, you have to realize sometimes they, they go in a different direction, but they make some good commentaries. Listen, there's a handful of teachers out there that are in big stadiums that I don't agree with about 75% of what they teach, but occasionally they'll get on a message and make a principle about something, and it's very accurate and very good, and I'll give them credit for that. So let's read this again from the top, because this is a very good description though it comes from the 1800s and it has a little bit of uh, old English kind of language and it. it's a little stuffy as we would say a little hint of legalism it's very good actually the tares are the children of the wicked one here is the character of sinners hypocrites and all profane and wicked people they are the children of the devil as a wicked one though they do not be they do not own his name it says yet they bear his image do his lust and from him, they have their education. In other words, his system is the system that's educating them, the cosmic system. He rules over them. He works in them. Okay, that's Marvin Vincent, 1888. I found that pretty profound and a, a pretty useful set of um, commentaries just for that word tears as far as this study in Matthew. Now, I'm going to have you guys turn to Ephesians chapter 2 with me. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look at some principles here concerning the tares. This lesson and probably the next one are going to get into what the tares are all about and how we need to view things with the tares and the wheat. It's, um, it's very uh, applicable, we would say, in the church age that we live in right now. We already established that the field represents the whole world. The field represents the whole world. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was that good farmer, we said, who spread the initial seeds that would become born-again believers who in turn grow give off fruit, and they give off more seeds, but now what comes into view is the enemy. Think about that for a minute. We established that this field that we're looking at in the parable speaks to the whole world, the world as a whole. Jesus Christ as the farmer, remember when he went to the cross, one of his last sayings was, Tenelestai, it is finished. And that had the connotation of being finished in eternity past and finished in the moment he was on the cross and continues to be finished until the end of time. So the work is complete. It is finished. Think about that. As the great farmer, the seeds, everything is complete and done. It's thrown out there. That becomes the born-again believers who in turn grow off to give fruit and seeds and pollinate themselves, as we would say. But now what comes into view is the enemy, folks. And I want you to think about something. The difference between believers and unbelievers is vast. It's much more vast than people think. And I don't want you to go negative on me because I'm going to straighten it out towards the end of the message. But I want you to think about it. 
There is a vast divide between believers and unbelievers, even though it may appear as a simple decision on the surface or a disagreement about eternity. It is much deeper than that. It runs much deeper than that, and you need to understand that. If you understand that in eternity past, a conflict or a spiritual warfare was erupted. It was proclaimed by Satan and his angelic army. So there was already sides chosen. There was already a combat chosen. It is the reason we were created. If you do not understand the angelic conflict and the invisible warfare that is going on, you truly don't understand why you were created, why you were here. So in eternity past, there was a conflict already established. There were sides already being chosen, we would say. And if I want you to think about it in the military. I don't know how many of you serve. I myself was an Army Reservist for quite a while. I know most of the people, uh, the men in my family, served in different branches. But a military officer, think about that. When a military officer rebels against the government and the leadership that he is under, over his country he's rebelling, basically. That is a declaration of warfare. That is a declaration of warfare. That's what happened with Satan and the fallen angels. Ephesians 2.1. Let's pick it up in Ephesians 2.1. You need to think about that mindset of a military officer who rebels against his own government, his own country, his own leadership, those above him, and all the principles about that country and leadership above him. He rebels. He's declaring warfare, folks. Ephesians 2.1. Paul says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in verse 2, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, the cosmic system, according to who? The prince and power of the atmosphere, the air of the spirit, small s, spirit, small s, that is now working in the sons of disobedience. There is no other way to look at this than unbelievers, folks, okay? All believers, at some point, were spiritually dead, all of us, myself included, spiritually dead we all followed a cosmic standard at one point or another i don't care if it was back when you were a teenager whenever you came to that point of knowledge of christ you came to an age of accountability so for some people it maybe it's 13 or 14 years old for somebody else maybe it's 18 or 20 but at some point or another you became accountable for your spiritual life and you heard the gospel of christ at that point when you became accountable you started to make choices folks okay so you chose sides, we would say. But all believers at some point were spiritually dead because we were all unbelievers. We were living with a cosmic standard that we believed in. All unbelievers are spiritually dead, period. All unbelievers, I don't care if they're, they're chanting, they're, they're, they're burning incense, and they seem like the most peaceful person in the world. If they are not a believer in Jesus Christ, they are spiritually dead. They are natural enemies of the cross of Christ by their own choice if they've heard the gospel by their own choice, because once they hear the gospel, folks, and you, it's, it's really presented you, to most people, I'd say the majority of the people, God makes sure the gospel is presented several times throughout their lifetime in many different ways, because even the rocks and trees, Scripture says, scream of the Creator and scream of Christ. So because they hear the gospel once, and they, they reject it, at that point they're making a decision, even if it's once, recognize who the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is, and they still reject that. They still reject that. That is a declaration of war. That's a rebellious attitude, but that's a declaration of war. It means this person has chosen a side. Now, they might uh, go down the road and hear it again and make a good choice and get on the right side, but they're making a choice. They're choosing a side. They're stepping over a line and saying, okay, there's a line in the sand. I'm stepping off to this side. You need to understand that. There is no middle ground. There is no middle ground. You are following Satan's system the God of this world, the prince and power of the atmosphere, or you are in union with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No middle ground. I don't care what anybody tells you in the world. I don't care how sweet and nice they seem to be. They are either an enemy of the cross or they are in union with Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 3. Among them, we too all formally lived. There it is, Paul saying, guess what? We all did. And Paul was a very religious man, a Pharisee, right? He was all trained to be a Pharisee. Religious man, okay, religious zealot, legalistic. We all too were formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Let me tell you something. Religious people are actually indulging their desire of the flesh. When they don't believe in Jesus Christ and they're just in a religious ritual mode and they're doing certain things, that's fulfilling something in their flesh. So that's probably a lesson for another day. But Paul is strictly saying here, all of us formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we're by nature, the old sin nature is in us, children of wrath, even as, as the rest. Children of wrath, that's what a believer is called in the Bible. That's one of the titles for him. That's not Rick. It's not Pastor Rick. That's God. Okay? 
way above my pay grade. The old sin nature is opposed to God, plain and simple. It is an enemy of the cross of Christ. It denies truth, the old sin nature in you. And we're, we're a, lot, a lot like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You've got to choose the right side to live in. But that old sin nature opposes God. It is an enemy of the cross. And it denies truth. It hates truth. It likes to twist it. The old sin nature replaces truth and true spirituality with the spirit of selfishness and promoting creature over creator. Let me say that again. The old sin nature is opposed to God. There's no way around it. It is an enemy of the cross of Christ. It denies truth. The old sin nature replaces truth and true spirituality with the spirit of selfishness and promoting creature over creator. Plain and simple. Galatians 5.17, what did Paul teach there? It tells us the old sin nature, the flesh, is in complete opposition to that new nature that is inside you. There's a battle going on. Galatians 5.17, Paul covers it. Spirit against the flesh, flesh against the spirit, okay? We're all a little bit schizophrenic, and that's why, folks. The unbeliever has no new nature, though. I don't care how sweet they are. The unbeliever has no new nature to tap into. They have only the old sin nature and whatever pseudo-spirituality that the cosmic system, Satan's system, is promoting at that time. That's all they have. Ephesians 2.4 goes on to say, but what God, being rich in his mercy, mercy for the past mistakes, grace that we live in, right? Rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Of course he loved us. That's why what, if the cross happened. Ephesians 2.5. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, all of us were, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Not of yourself, folks. No works. Ephesians 2, 6, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus at the right hand of God the Father, the right hand of the divine throne. You are in union with Christ. You share in everything with Jesus Christ. Whether you feel it or not, it's not about emotional nonsense, folks. Sorry to tell you if you've been going to a denomination that's into uh, emotional nonsense. And no, I have no denomination affiliation. I'm non-denominational. I always will be. I'm, I'm just like what the apostles were. Obviously, they're greater men than me, so I don't want to place myself like that. But I just try to study the scriptures to the best of my ability. Let the Spirit lead me and teach you. Not about denominations and, do, and denominational dogma and nonsense, folks. But here is what the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is often described by liberal teachers to be the skinny hippie who promoted love and unity. Here's what the skinny hippie, as they would say, the liberal teachers would say, said to some people, and sometimes he was a little hard and harsh, and guess what? He was probably a pretty rough and tumble guy because he was a laborer, not just a carpenter, if you understand the original language, a laborer, which means he was moving around huge logs and stones and dealing with that type of furniture back in the day and construction back in the day. He wasn't a skinny wimp, but here's what that skinny hippie, as the liberal teachers will teach, said, John 8, 44, <clears throat> you are of the fa your father the devil, he said. Not too sweet, not too kind, is it? And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. Matter of fact, he speaks from his own nature. There it is right there, excuse me. <clears throat> For he is a liar and the father of lies. Something caught in my throat there for a second. Kingdom of Darkness trying to block me. <clears throat> from getting this message out, so now my eye's tearing, but that's all right. We're going to keep going forward. This was addressed to Jewish leaders. This is, that, like I said, the liberal teachers will tell you he's always sweet and kind and all that stuff. Jesus Christ was hard sometimes. He taught harsh messages. As much love and compassion as he had, he also was a tough guy on one, one, one realm of it. You have to understand Christ fully and not just put him in a box in one realm. And unfortunately, there's a lot of folks that do this. But this was addressed to Jesus, the Jewish leaders who were already calling him a liar and a demon. That's what they were calling him. And they had continued to increase their verbal attacks upon his ministry. When we look at this parable of tares among the wheat, it speaks to church-age mystery doctrine and then points us right into the future of the tribulation period coming up. That's what it gets into. Tears among the wheat are believers and unbelievers living side by side, or as they say, the French Canadians, because I'm half French Canadian, the French Canadians in New England say side by each. <laughs> believers and unbelievers living side by each. My Pepe used to say, my grandpa used to say, throw me down the stairs my hat, will you? <laughs> it's a French Canadian New England thing, you have to understand that. But anyhow, 
Tears among the wheat, on believers and unbelievers, living side by side, side by each in this world, without the physical presence of who? The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Remember, I said his physical presence is removed during some of these parables. The wheat are the positive believers who are indwelt by the Trinity and have the power to reflect the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ if they so choose. But the tares are right alongside of them and can easily strangle them out or cause their growth to be stunted if that wheat is growing too close to the tear. So we're going to cover this, not necessarily just today, but into the next lesson we're going to talk about what the tares and the wheat mean together. You're going to get a good look at it between today's lesson and the next week's lesson when I do that. The wheat are the positive believers who are indwelt by the Trinity and have the power to reflect the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but the tares are right alongside of them, living right next to them, right close to them, working with them in their family and friends, and can easily strangle them out or cause their growth to be stunted if the wheat is growing too close to the tear. The wheat is growing too close to the tear. Not that it can't be next to it, not too close. That's what I want you to think about in this lesson. This tear you're talking about is a weed. And Darnell is one of the titles or names for it. It's known to grow in certain regions. Palestine is an area that this toxic weed actually shows up on the map, resembling wheat. It resembles wheat. It has an interior fungus, though, that is capable of causing illness and intoxication or even death if a large amount is consumed. So back in the day, you could chew on a little bit of this and get high, folks. Yes, you could. The close resemblance to wheat makes it very difficult to distinguish from growing wheat stalks, which is believers and unbelievers side by side. I'll give you a moment because I need to refresh my throat with some water to take this slide down. And think about the analogies in all this. The tear, which, I, like I said, if you study this, the, 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 the weed, Darnell is one of the terms for it, is known to grow in certain regions Right in Palestine is one of the areas where, it's, where we grow. So Jesus is teaching something that really is applicable for that day. And it was resembling the wheat. Okay, it was hard to differentiate between the two, but it had a fungus that was capable of intoxicating you to the point of death if you weren't careful. And it had a very close resemblance to wheat. It makes it very difficult, actually, to distinguish when the two start to grow side by side along each other. So when you think about that, I want you to think about the analogies we live in today with believers and unbelievers side by side. And I'm not sure if the French still call this Darnell or if they coined the phrase. I can't remember who. I didn't want to go too crazy on a side search with it. But it is known for its ability to make someone appear drunk or become ill if it's ingested. So it, it gives an appearance of drunk if you chew on a little bit of it. If you eat too much of it, it might be able to kill you because of the fungus that's inside of it. So this weed was known for destroying large sections of wheat crops if it was left unchecked and you didn't deal, deal with the ground. If the ground was not properly prepared, there it is right there, soul structure. If the ground was not properly prepared and very early on the farmers did not look for the tares among the wheat, once they began to grow, it is difficult to tell them apart. Are you seeing the analogies here? Okay. The weed was known for destroying crops. It could destroy whole crops if the ground was not properly prepared and the, er and the farmers very early on didn't start to see it because once they grow to a certain point, you can't distinguish between the two. You've got to figure it out pretty early on. And the safe step was always to have the ground prepared the right way and make sure you didn't have any old seeds of old weeds left in the ground. So you had to tear it up pretty good. But I want you to think about the analogy of the soul structure we got into. Once the tear begins to sprout within a few short weeks, within a few short weeks of growth, it becomes impossible to tell them apart from the wheat. It will only be much later when that crop grows that you're going to see difference in size and certain qualities or shapes of the tear compared to a wheat stalk. By then it's too late. In fact, it becomes dangerous to start pulling them out because it may cause damage to the wheat at that point once they've grown to a certain level. They're heading towards maturity and it's too late then. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would later clarify all of this to his future teachers, and he did too in verse 37, Matthew 13, 37. What does he say to them? Some of these parables he went back and taught on. Other ones he kind of left open-ended for a later period when the Holy Spirit would come upon the church and these men would understand these things a little deeper. But Jesus said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. He's speaking about himself. Verse 38, the field is the world. Very obvious. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, sons and daughters, we can say, okay? And the tares are the sons of the evil one. This speaks more directly to unbelievers, actually, who are being used by fallen angels to attack and ridicule the truth 
of Scripture, and some are used, sadly, some are used in subtle ways to resemble Christian qualities, Christian standards, yet they're twisting and choking out the truth. Think about that for a moment. We talk about these tares here, and what he's talking about, the sons of the evil one. This speaks directly to unbelievers who are being used. I'm not saying every unbeliever is, but every unbeliever is, is following the cosmic system, which means the Satan system. But unbelievers who are being used by fallen angels to attack and ridicule the truth of Scripture, and some are used in subtle ways, very subtle ways, to resemble Christian qualities. The wheat and the tare look similar. Resemble Christian qualities, Christian teachings, and standards, yet are twisting and choking out the truth. They are tares in the field of this world. They do no good. They do harm in the long run. Unprofitable in themselves. Hurtful to the good seeds, which is really sad. Hurtful to the good seeds, both by temptation, tempting the good seeds to go in a different direction, and persecution, persecuting the good seeds. They're weeds in the garden. They have the same rain, the same sunshine, the same soil with the good plants, but are good for what? Nothing. The tares are among the weeds, believers and unbelievers living together side by side. Same soil, same, same sun, same rain hitting them, growing side by side. One can affect the other, folks. Unfortunately, the good can't do much with the bad. In other words, the wheat really can't stop the tear from being poisonous, but that poisonous tear can do some damage to the wheat. Though it has a strong emphasis on tribulation teaching, yes, this does, it is already a process alive and well in the church age that we live in right now. We currently have groups of unbelievers attacking Christianity and all it stands for, folks, each and every day. It started many, many years ago, folks, as well as what pseudo-Christian teaching, a twisted version of Scripture that is designed to embrace cosmic viewpoint and fulfill secular agendas. I'll give you a moment to take a note on this slide because it's important. Yes, this points to tribulational teaching, but this is also pertinent for the church age that we live in. We currently have, and you know it, and I know it, groups of unbelievers, all kinds of unbelievers all around us in different sections that really attack Christianity. They do it verbally most of the time, but there are physical attacks throughout the world, actually. But everything it stands for, they're trying to cut away at and chop away at, strangle it out, as well as what pseudo-Christian teaching and teachers Okay, fake. And they, they, they use certain scriptures, but they twist them. They use twisted versions of scriptures that are designed in the long run to embrace and open up the doors to secular agendas and cosmic viewpoint. That's what it's designed for, and that's how, why they're teaching. Because eventually they open their doors up to allow lies to come in on top of, just like the, um, the enemy basically sowed his seed on top of the wheat, the good wheat. These churches nowadays, there's a lot of pseudo-Christianity out there that open the doors up so later on lies can be built on top of the truth. That's what you need to be careful of. Because as we know, the serpent in the garden fooled the woman with a little bit of twisted scripture. Just a couple words, that's all it takes. I need you to notice something that often gets overlooked in this scripture as well. Matthew 13, 25. A lot of times it doesn't get taught this way. It kind of gets glazed over and it becomes very important because it sticks to uh, some of the principles we talked about, apathy and arrogance, in recent weeks in our lessons. Matthew 13, 25, but while his men were sleeping, think about that, okay, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. The enemy attacks when we are tired, folks, I've told you that, when you're worn out, when you're feeling frustrated, apathetic or ignorant toward the truth. Those are openings for Satan to come in and plant. Satan will do his best to wear down the saints. We've talked about that, Daniel 12. Because that is when they're vulnerable. They're most vulnerable when they're worn out and tired. How it is interpreted in the original context when you look at this scripture would be like saying the enemy came in on top of the crop, the good wheat, and the enemy planted right on top of the work that was already done. That's how it's really looked at. And that's what Satan does. He'll sit back and let something be planted and realize, okay, they're, they're a believer they're already kind of growing in the plan of God. I'll sit back for a little bit, let them, kind of, let them kind of relax in their Christianity for a period of time. Then I'll start hitting them from different directions, get them a little confused or tired or frustrated in my system. Then I can come in and choke out those roots and drag them away. That's one of his assaults. That's one of his areas that he attacks, folks. Notice the men, though. I want you to notice something. The men, who? His men, the farmer's men. Jesus Christ is, 
is the farmer, right? His men left in charge of the field did what? They fell asleep. No one was left on guard duty. No one was walking a patrol. No one had picked up their rifle, as we used to say in the Army. Pick up a rifle and stand your post. Nobody was doing that. This speaks to pastor teachers, those in positions of authority in general, really. Apathy and arrogance, what are the things we've talked about recently? And this is talking to leadership. His men were sleeping. You know what I thought about? America. America pulled the Bible out of the school systems back in the 1960s. I'm old enough to remember some of this stuff, right? We, America did. We pulled the Bible out of the school system in the 1960s, the first book that all American schools use for literature, historic context, and poetry was the Bible, the Christian Bible. All schools. That was the first and only book in the earliest American school systems, folks. It was pulled in the 1960s. Government leadership and church leadership and Christian citizens, because we all got to take responsibility, fell asleep on that field. And now we reap the damage from our youth since that point. I want you to think about what I just said. The Bible, the Christian Bible, was the earliest and the only book in the original school system here in America. In the 1960s, it was completely pulled out. Government leadership, church leadership, yes, pastors and teachers, Christian citizens that are claiming to be strong Christians, fell asleep on the field. The enemy came in. Now we reap the damage from our youth since that point forward. This is just one example. One example. We've been slowly robbed of our freedoms. We have apathetically sat back year after year as Satan's cosmic system grabs one small, subtle victory after another. Give a little ground, pretty soon they want a little more ground. I can get into an example, but I don't want to get uh, uh, sidetracked. I also don't want to get uh, censored right here and right now. But certain lifestyles, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, would consider to be, well, we really don't want that those, those folks to kind of get into a marriage thing because Christian marriage is this. It's not that. You guys know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Once they got this, now they want something else. Once Satan kicks the door open, it's just like government. Once they put their hand in your pocket, it's not coming out. It's only going to get worse. One small, subtle victory after another was slowly giving over our freedoms and was slowly slipping into a sleep. My personal opinion, folks, okay? This big push in recent years for socialism and really soft socialism has already been introduced by the last three administrations prior to President Trump is astounding to me. Astounding that it is on mainstream platforms and mainstream media and that it's part of the debates for the next presidential election. Socialism. Like I said, the last several administrations, three or four prior to uh, the one that's in there now, were already introducing soft socialism. But now it's part of our presidential debate. It's on the mainstream media platforms. Like it's a normal subject. It's all the proof I need to say the majority of the Christians are clueless, apathetic, and asleep at the wheel. My personal opinion. Trust me, we already live in soft socialism, which is really the battle all along. It's really the battle all along. Just subtle changes here and there, a little bit here and there, a little change, a little nip and tuck and, and pull away at the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, just subtle changes here and there. They, then they can finally come in for big sweeping changes later on once we've completely dozed off to sleep at the wheel. Both sides of the political aisle I'm talking about here. I don't care if it's a D or an R behind their name. Both sides of the political aisle have dabbled in it and introduced it since the 1970s and prior to when the progressive movement really took, char uh, took a bite out of America in the 30s and 40s. The progressive movement started to really pick up steam and then it faded, then it came back. It's back again, full, full steam. But since the 70s, soft socialism has been introduced by both sides of the aisle it is here to stay. Another good sign, folks, that the rapture is probably getting closer and closer each day. So I don't want to get sidetracked anyhow. Let me move on with the message because we want to be able to do the Lord's Supper. Some of that was my own personal opinion. I could actually teach, though, doctrinal that um, nationalism is a thing that God stood for. If you look at, do a study on the nation of Israel, you'd understand what I'm talking about. And socialism, capitalism is actually um, seen all over the Bible, okay, where government gets their hand out of our pockets and lets us grow our businesses and do what we want with our money. So a lesson for another day. Don't let me get sidetracked here. The believer is not to reject 
or attack the unbeliever, folks. That would be against the teaching of Jesus Christ. But to stand firm in the truth, resist that cosmic viewpoint, okay? Don't become part of it. Be a beacon of light for others to see, to find guidance without being an obnoxious, bitter, legalistic fool that no one will ever seek advice from. Let me say that again. The believer is not to reject or attack the unbeliever. That's never a statement that would make any sense pertaining to Christianity. It is not the teaching of Jesus Christ, but to stand firm in the truth, resist that cosmic viewpoint, don't fold into it, be a beacon of light for others to see and find that guidance without being an obnoxious, bitter, legalistic fool that no one will ever seek advice from. Why is that important, that they seek advice or seek conversation with you? How else are you going to evangelize? Unless you go over to people and hit them over the head with legalism and bitterness. Be very careful. It's really nice when people come to you because they've seen what your actions look like. Your, your words and your actions start to line up and they say, This Christian guy, he's pretty good. He doesn't hit me over the head with the Bible. You know, he tells me a little bit of truth here and there. I got a problem. Maybe he'll have an answer. Let me go ask him. That's your perfect opportunity. That gets more people born again and saved than you go charging somebody, a stranger on the street, with all kinds of verses and throwing it at them. You need, to, uh, you need to understand, you need to know how to fish, folks, okay? Fishermen don't make a lot of noise and splash all over the water. They pick the right type of bait, they take their time, they're very patient how they cast out there. Why do you think Jesus Christ picked fishermen and said, I'll make you fishers of men? Think about fishing. There's techniques to it, okay? This is a balance, folks. This is a balance you will not achieve. This is what I'm talking about, how to do this outside a relationship with God and spiritual growth in your life. You just simply won't. You will either get burnt out and fall away from your relationship with God or become an angry Christian who no one wants to be around. Let me say that again. You'll either get burnt out doing things in your flesh and doing things the wrong way, and you'll fall away from your relationship with God and start to look like an unbeliever, or you're going to become one of those angry, bitter Christians who no one wants to be around. Ever ask yourself, how come the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did so well with the outcasts, the criminals, and the foreigners when he walked on the earth? That's who he did really well with, the foreigners, the outcasts, the criminals. He did really well with them, right? Some of the kind of the rough and tumble guys and gals out there. That's who he did really good with because he didn't have this attitude right here. Legalistic Pharisee, Luke 18, 11, the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like these other people. Unbelievable arrogance. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like the tax collector, who, which this we know this one is about, where the tax collector is actually across the street, pounding on his chest, crying out to God, saying, I know I'm a sinner, I need help. God heard that man, not this Pharisee. Understand that. This is the attitude in the hearts of many, many legalistic Christians. Folks, sin is sin. Sin is sin. People don't like to hear that. Prostitution, drug addiction, alcoholism, robbing a bank are looked upon in the divine courtroom of heaven just as arrogance, lying, and pride. Same thing. Sin is sin. You need to find a balance. You need to find a balance. You cannot operate in this balance if you are a baby believer. You need spiritual maturity because it'll be confusing and difficult for you. Look how the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ handles situations. He did not just become like the unbelievers. Oh, let me blend right in. That you don't get a sense of that, okay? He didn't become a sinner himself to fit in. That's not what I'm saying, but he did have a profound effect on their lives. Matthew 9.10. We studied this before in my study right here on Matthew. You have to go back probably nine months, maybe a year. Then it happened as Jesus was reclining at the table. He knew well, whose house he was in. This is about Matthew, calling the calling for Matthew. Matthew's friends were a little shady characters, okay? Matthew liked a little bit of party lifestyle. You know, tax collectors were kind of known as low-level mobsters. Like, think about it. Jesus reclining at the table in the house. Behold, many tax collectors, many of these guys shaved off the top like low-level mobsters. And sinners, meaning mostly prostitutes, Came, it was party time, came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. Does it say Jesus became just like them? No, you never get a sense of that. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was relaxed, and when they called him out on this, and of course the legalistic crowd did, he told them, I'm here to help the sick and dying. I'm a physician. That's why I'm here. You don't run away from the sick and dying. He said, I desire compassion. He quoted the Old Testament. I desire compassion, not sacrifice. 
For I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. And in fact, some of that's got a little sarcasm laced in it, divine sarcasm, because they thought they were so righteous. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ called out what was right and what was wrong, but he did not attempt to condemn and judge at every opportunity that came up. He called out what was right and what was wrong. You can talk the truth to somebody calmly, and when they when they start to say, well, you're trying to make me feel guilty? No, I'm not. I've got sin in my life, too. I've got failures. I, sometimes the best thing you can do is relate your own failures, your own past, or something you're going through where you failed, and you talk to somebody who's an unbeliever and say, God can clean that up. God can fix that. God can forgive that. That's compassion. That's you just speaking the truth. That's not saying, well, no, that's okay. Keep living like that. You never get that sense. Jesus never taught that. The apostles never taught that. Thank God he saved sinners and criminals. That's how I got here, okay? Let's prepare to take in the Lord's Supper. I'm sorry if I'm preaching, but sometimes you see things and people talk to you about things. Somebody sent me a video and it was about a crazy Christian yelling across the table at somebody or at a store or something. And I said, that's what gives Christianity a bad name. Then you think about the preachers that are always trying to hitch in the pocketbook. That's what gives Christianity a bad name. Emotional nonsense, sweating and slurping on the stage, and healing and signs and miracles. What That gives Christianity a bad name. But to evangelize and get mad at somebody when you're evangelizing and start swearing at them, that gives Christianity a bad name. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came to save a lost and dying world. Save the wicked, the arrogant, yes, the lost and those no one else would care about. He asks only that you and I believe in who he has said he is and proven he is. That's all he asks. The great I am of the Old Testament, the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the great physician, the good shepherd, this good farmer we're looking at, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the King of kings, Lord of lords, the one and only Savior, the rock of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. The one ritual, the only ritual left for church-age believers to habitually partake in is the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, which speaks to eternal gratitude, giving thanks at the highest level. It points to a celebration, recognition of his almighty power and grace and redemption that he offers all of mankind if we want to accept the offer. The line in the sand is drawn, get on one side or the other. With a grateful heart, with a grateful heart, folks, I'm going to lift up this bread. When the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said, This is my body which is broken for you. Each time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we bring him into remembrance. Let us eat the bread and remember our Lord. In the same grateful manner, get your cup if you have it, folks. If you're partaking in this. In a grateful manner, we lift up the cup, a cup of the blood of Christ, representing the blood of Christ. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said, the blood of a new and everlasting covenant, because when we eat the bread of his body and drink the cup of his blood, we proclaim him, his work, his second coming. Let us drink this cup. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time you have to come and study a word. And bless all of those that lift this ministry up and Father, if anybody's heard this message today and never believed on your precious Son as the Lord and Savior, let them today be that opening. Let the knocking and that door be open. Let God, the Holy Spirit, build that temple and that soul structure. Today is a day. Believe on the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Amen.